So on our previous uh, lesson, we described the episode in Jacob's life where he was leaving his father-in-law's home and returning to his own, his own home, his own family, his own territory. We know that he had arrived at Laban's uh, home while on the run from his brother Esau, who had threatened to kill him, so that you know, he was not off to a good start. Laban then manipulated and cheated him for 20 years for his two daughters and eventually to build up his own flocks. Now Jacob is escaping this situation with his wives and children to return to, well actually, an uncertain situation back home. Uh, he faced Laban, who had been warned by God not to harm him and confronted him about his past, you know, the manipulations, the cheating, and so on and so forth. And in the end, they make a treaty of peace and Laban returns home without harming Jacob. Now, Jacob would face his greatest enemy, and that was his brother Esau. You know, Laban was a manipulator. You know, he, would, he would manipulate to get an advantage to become rich, but Esau, Esau had threatened to kill him. So you know, there, was, there was trouble back there. And I think we need to remember one thing here. Um, Jacob returns because God told him to go back. He's not going back because he's nostalgic or homesick. You know, his brother still is ready to, you know, to kill him, so for him to go back was to risk death. We kind of forget that point you know, uh, when we look at the, the story, thinking, well, he's going home, everything is great. No, he's going back to an uncertain uh, situation, but he obeys God. So let's get into the text, chapter 32, beginning in verse one. It says, now as Jacob went on his way, the angels of God met him. Jacob said when he saw them, this is God's camp. So he named that place uh, Mahanaim. Mahanaim, that's it, Mahanaim. So Jacob is alone and he's uh, pretty helpless with his small group, mostly women and children. His faith is uh, demonstrated in his obedience in listening to God and going home. Now we know it was the promised land he was going to, it was his inheritance but you know, what good would it be if he was killed when he got there? Not much to look forward to. So in this very short scene here, two verses, God opens the eyes of his heart to see two angels. And that's what the name means. It means two hosts that are there to protect him. And so he draws new courage for the journey once he sees literally who is going with him. So you know, sometimes you read that, you wonder why is that there? Well, it's there because Jacob needed encouragement. He needed a, some strength you know, to face the uncertain and perhaps dangerous situation that he was going to have um, when he got uh, home. So we, we notice you know, uh, uh, he draws new courage for the journey once he sees these two angels. And I want you to notice how this new courage and confidence makes him act not with bravado or pride, but with humility and meekness. Uh, those who are, there's a lesson there, you know, those who are really strong can afford to be meek. They don't have to throw their weight around. You know, we, we learn that, we see that all the time, don't we? Just human nature. So Jacob now prepares to meet his brother Esau. We read that beginning in verse uh, three. It says, then Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He also commanded them saying, thus you shall say to my Lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen and donkeys and flocks and male and female servants and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. The messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and furthermore he is coming to meet you and 400 men are with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people who were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two companies. For he said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the company which is left will escape. So Jacob doesn't know what to expect, so he sends messengers in advance, you know, in advance of their meeting. 
If Esau felt threatened that Jacob was pressing his blessing promise to some political advantage over Esau, Jacob tries to ease this fear by having his servants address him as Lord. He says to his servants, when you meet Esau, you address him as Lord. You, you take, you know, we're taking the subservient position here because he doesn't want Esau to think ahead of time, oh, my brother's coming back, you know, he's got the blessing, he's going to try to you know, press his case, he's going to try to uh, usurp my authority in this area. So Esau, uh, not Esau, but Jacob wanted to reassure his brother that he had his own wealth and he didn't need or desire any of Esau's property. You know, he doesn't, you know, Esau doesn't know what Jacob is going to do. Maybe Jacob is coming back and said, okay, the promise is mine, that, may, that means all what you have is mine. So he accorded him the respect due an older brother. And his older brother, Esau, was also a chief in that area, and he accords him the respect that the younger brother owes to the older one, and one would give to, the, to a, a chieftain in that area by taking the inferior position, not only in the language that he uses, but in the approach that he's going to make to his brother. So the servants find Esau sooner than they thought. Esau apparently knew that Jacob's caravan was heading his direction and he had already began, begun riding towards them. He heard the servants, but he may not have trusted his brother. Because remember, his brother, you know, as far as he remembers, was a wily character, a usurper, a trickster. So he, you know, he doesn't know what's taken place in the last 20 years. So Jacob at this point falters in his faith and he devises a common tactic to divide the caravan with the hope that part of it will make it through. You know, maybe they'll chase some of us down, kill some of us, maybe some of us may be able to get through. So Jacob cries out to God for help in what seemed like an impossible situation. I mean, think about it. He couldn't go back to Laban, couldn't do that. It couldn't stay where they were. And then going forward to meet Esau, in his mind, perhaps meant danger, even death. Note the elements contained in the prayer of a desperate man. And that's what we're going to read, the prayer of a desperate man. Verse, uh, uh, verse nine, he reviews the, the promises. He calls on God and he says, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your relatives and I will prosper you. So he calls out to God, he uses two terms, Elohim, which means the God of power, and Jehovah, the God of promise. And what he does is he re reviews the promises of God to protect him. You know, it's like, uh, not second guessing, but you know, I guess it's whistling in the dark. You know, I don't know what that expression is, but he's saying, now you remember you said you were going to protect me, right? That, that's what his prayer is. You made this promise to me, and I'm, I'm just reviewing this promise because it doesn't look like this promise is being fulfilled here. My brother is racing towards me. Verse 10, he recognizes his situation, his true situation. He says, I'm unworthy of all the loving kindness and of all the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant. For with my staff only, I crossed this Jordan and now I have become two companies. So he recognizes his own situation, that the reason he has received blessing and protection is because of God's kindness, not because of his own work or value. He says, I came, all I had was a staff. I had nothing when I crossed you know, the river the first time, heading towards my you know, Laban, and now I'm coming back and I have two companies, meaning I have two groups, wives, children, cattle, servants, and so on and so forth. Verse 10. He makes a specific request. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, that he will come and attack me and the mothers with the children. So he makes a specific request for safety and protection. Verse 12, for you said, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which is too great to be numbered. 
And so he summarizes the idea that the protection of God is necessary for the promise to be fulfilled. In other words, look Lord, if, you want, if you're going to make a great nation out of me, it doesn't make any sense if my brother kills me at this point here. And so he's, don't we do that sometimes? We kind of reason with God, we give him reasons and we kind of you know, have a discussion with him you know, about his tactics or what he's doing. So after his prayer, Jacob sets about to demonstrate in a concrete way what are the unseen intentions of his heart. He wants peace, that's what he wants. He wants peace and reconciliation with his brother and the best way to show this is by sending a gift ahead to Esau. So he divides a large portion of his animals into five portions and each servant is to walk behind each herd and flock. I didn't read all of this here, it's too long, but I'm just kind of summarizing it for you from verse 13 to 23. The idea is that as Esau approaches, wave after wave of animals and servants with messages of reconciliation and goodwill will meet them. So he's trying to wear his brother down with kindness, with offers of peace, and so on and so forth. Jacob is assured that God will protect him, but he is exemplifying God's gracious spirit in his attitude towards his brother. Now some people read this and they see this as a bribe. But a bribe is given when there's no other leverage available. Jacob had two angels, remember? He's traveling with the two angels. He doesn't need to bribe his brother. He's got two angels, he's got muscle. But he was giving a gift to his brother to try to win his brother back in the spirit of graciousness, in the spirit of, of Christ. Now we read a, a really interesting part here about Jacob wrestling with God. Very interesting passage here. Let me just set the context and then we'll, we'll read. Jacob has sent his servants and his flocks ahead. He's put his wives and children across the river in camps to prepare for the next day's meeting with Esau. And he's left alone with his fears and doubts and prayers. So he's by himself. He's, left, he's, pushed, you know, he's told everyone to go ahead of him. This passage here that we're going to read describes his wrestling or his conflict in prayer to God as he weighs two opposite forces taking place. And isn't that what stress is? Isn't that what causes stress in our lives many times? There are two opposing things that are fighting for, for a preeminence in our, in our priorities or in our situations, so on and so forth. So for him, the two things um, are, on the one hand, he's got, he's got God's promise to protect and bless him, and his faith is in that. But on the other, there's the appearance of his brother who has vowed to kill him. And both of these things are very powerful. And both, by the way, you know, he, he, ha he hasn't seen the end of yet. God's promise is still a promise. And his brother's promise to kill him is still a promise yet unfulfilled. So he's got these two competing unfulfilled promises that are, you know, that are fighting against each other in his heart, in his, um, in his mind. So let's read verse 24. It says, then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Now, it's unfortunate that the word wrestle nowadays conjures up an image of sport you know, or show business. You know, we're thinking of smackdown when we, <laughs> when we think about wrestling. But here, the word wrestle means to grapple. Actually, the, the closest word is to cling. You ever have your, your little brother you know, hang on to you or your little kid grab your leg and you're trying to, okay, get away, daddy's got to go. You know? This is, don't think wrestling, I got you in a headlock. And I'm not, this is not the image here that this word is trying to convey. Clinging, grappling with. So the idea is that Jacob was clinging to God who was appearing to him as a man. Now some people say it's an angel, but I don't believe it was an angel because he says, later on verse 30, he says, I have seen God face to face. 
So you know, God has appeared as a man, obviously, in Jesus, you know, in, the, in the New Testament, but He's also appeared as a man to Abraham when He came accompanied by two angels. And before Jacob saw the two angels, now he grapples and clings, wrestles with the Lord in the form of a man. So there's, there's a lot of literature about Jesus you know, appearing in various forms before actually coming as the Messiah. So the point is that he is praying for deliverance and he clings to God until he's sure that God will deliver him. So we read verse 25. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh, so the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Again, a lot of misinterpretation here, the idea that Jacob won the battle, like it was a fight and Jacob won. Well, you know, if you're wrestling with God, there's no way you're the winner, okay? The point is, um, it's not that Jacob was stronger or won the battle, but that Jacob clung tenaciously to God in prayer and hung on. You never had that experience? Something's going very badly in your life, something you're hoping against hope, and you're praying, you're, you're, you're just hanging on to your faith, you're hanging on to God. This is what he's talking about here, and God permits. His infirmity was not a punishment, it's not, okay, I'm going to get rid of you, I'm going to you know, take out your socket, no. His punishment was a sign of his experience as well as a demonstration of God's power. God let him hang on, but demonstrated in the end that he did have greater power than, than Jacob. Just a, just a marvelous visual here about how um, involved we can become in prayer when it's something that's very, very important to us. You know, I can, I, I've, I've mentioned this story a while back, but I remember when our daughter, for example, uh, Emily was traveling with, uh, I think she was traveling with Carrie, if I'm not mistaken, and they had gone to Hawaii to babysit Kim's kids while you know, Kim and Tess were on vacation. And the night before, and Lisa and I were traveling, we were in New Mexico, and the night before, uh, Emily called and said, oh, it's going to be great tomorrow. Carrie and I are going on a helicopter ride, the Blue Moon helicopter ride in Hawaii. We're going to go visit. Oh, well, great. Okay, have a good time. Well, we'll call you tomorrow and let you know how it went, Dad. Okay. So that night we're at the hotel, da, 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 the next day Lisa's in the hotel, she's checking out and I've got the car, I brought the car up front and I turn on the radio and the news, you know, and on the news it says a terrible tragedy has taken place in Hawaii, a blue moon helicopter with two young women crashed and all aboard were killed. The prayer that I was making there was not Dear Lord, thank you for today, dear Lord. That wasn't the prayer. My prayer at that moment was, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, please, God, no, oh God. That's all I could say. And we couldn't get in touch. We were in, we were in New Mexico and there was no cell, cell phone. If you've ever traveled through New Mexico, you know there are a lot of pockets where you, that was the longest hour, Lisa and I, we had nothing to do. I told her and we were listening to the radio and, and finally, I think it's you I called, finally I, we got cell service and I called uh, Bob and, and he said, oh, it's okay, it's not, it's not them. You know? And then I talked to Emily, it's not us, Dad. We were on another one. I mean, and then you had this whiplash effect. Okay, not our daughters, but somebody else's daughters somebody else you know, had the thing that I thought I would have to go through. And I want to tell you, talk about wrestle with God. Talk about clinging to God and saying, if this has happened, I'm destroyed. You're, I'm nothing. 
please. So you can, you know, we all have to wrestle with God at one time or another in our lives. And I, I, this passage here is especially poignant to me because of our uh, past experience. All right, let's, let, let's keep moving. It says in verse 26, it says, Then he said, Let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him and said, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he says, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. So Jacob wants the blessing. He wants the assurance that God will deliver him and bless him with the things that he has promised. And to show that he has received it, his name is changed from Jacob, which means the supplanter, to Israel, which means the prevailer. Now Israel, some of you may know, the word Israel in Hebrew means several things depending on which part of the word that you emphasize. So if you emphasize one part of the word, it means a, a, a prince, you know, a prince with God. If you emphasize another part of the word, it means one who fights victoriously with God. And then another way, another form of it means as a prince thou hast power. So Jacob asks his name, but the man asks why he should ask, because he should already know who he is. Don't ask me who my name is. You know who, I, you know who my name is. You know who I am. You know this experience. So he names the place Peniel, which means the face of God, which demonstrates that he didn't know with whom he was struggling. So we go to verse 31 and 32, it says, Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Penuel, and he was limping on his thigh. Therefore to this day the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip which is on the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh in the sinew of the hip. A little postscript there that he was now ready, even though he was actually weaker because of his infirmity, to meet with his brother. So I, God says, I'm going to get you ready to meet your brother. <laughs> now you have to limp. <laughs> Before at least you could run away, now you can't even run away. So uh, this is also, uh, this, there's also a mention of the tradition begun by the Jews to honor Jacob in their food customs. So now we move to Jacob's meeting with Esau, chapter 33, beginning in verse one. It says, then Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming, and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. He put the maids and their children in front, and Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph last. But he himself passed on ahead of them and bowed down to the ground seven times until he came to his brother. Then Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. He lifted his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, Who are these with you? So he says, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maids came near with their children and they bowed down. Leah likewise came near with her children and they bowed down. And afterward Joseph came near with Rachel and they bowed down. So as soon as daybreak comes, Jacob sees Esau approaching them in the distance. He places his family in order of importance. I mean, there, there is a brazen show of favoritism right there, right? He puts the servant girls and their children and then Leah, you know, didn't love her as much and Rachel last, you know, uh, but that's just the way it is. It was custom in those times for one to bow seven times when approaching a king. That was the custom. And you see that in movies sometimes, when somebody leaves the room you know, of, of a king, they, they walk backwards and they, they bow you know, seven times. And so Jacob uh, does this to show proper respect to Esau, who is the local chief. He's the local chieftain. Now, 
his spiritual vision is such that he can tell the difference between the spiritual significance of the promises and the immediate circumstances that he finds himself in. In other words, he knows he has the promises, he knows he has two angels protecting him, he knows he's wrestled with God and prevailed, he knows that God has assured him that he's going to fulfill all the promises through him and through his family, he knows all of that, he has that spiritual insight, but he's in his brother's hometown and his brother's the chief. And so his spiritual insight enables him to pay proper respect to Esau in the context that they find themselves in. He can tell the difference and he can accept the difference. He is the rightful inheritor, he's the one with the blessing, the one who has wrestled with God, but now he's, in, he's the younger brother who has come home to face his older brother who is for now the local chief. God's protection is demonstrated not in a mighty you know, military victory, but rather in the tender heart of Esau, who upon seeing him, welcomes him with joy and love. Jacob had nothing to do with that. He didn't talk him into it, nothing. Esau's heart was tender towards his brother. So after Jacob introduces his family as the brothers unite. So let's keep reading. It says, uh, and he says, what do you mean by all this company which I have met? And he said, to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have plenty, my brother. Let what, uh, let what you have be your own. And Jacob said, no, please, if now I have found favor in your sight, then take my present from my hand, for I see the face as one sees the face of God, and you have received me favorably. Please take my gift, which has been uh, brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have plenty, thus, he urged him and he took it. So we see the final confirmation of their reconciliation and that's the fact that Esau accepts Jacob's gift. The custom at that time was that it was a sure sign of peace when an offered gift was accepted. It wasn't about the value or money, it was about the reconciliation, it's political. Now in Hebrew, Esau says, I have much. And in Hebrew, we don't see the distinction in English. So Esau says, I have much, and Jacob answers, I have everything. We don't, we don't see the distinction in English, but in Hebrew there's a distinction there, signifying his source of blessing from God. So God had worked in both of their hearts to make each of them gracious to each other and thereby protect the promise which Jacob's family was going to carry forward. Keep reading, verse 12, then Esau said, let us take our journey and go and I will go before you. But he said to him, my Lord knows that the children are frail and that the flocks and herds which are nursing are a care to me. And if they are driven hard one day, all flocks will die. Please let my Lord pass on before his servant and I will proceed at my leisure according to the pace of the cattle that are before me and according to the pace of the children until I come to my Lord at Seir. Esau said, please let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of uh, my Lord. Uh, I think there's another verse here, right. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir, and Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built for himself a house and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the place is named Succoth. So now that the reconciliation is complete, Esau offers to travel with him, to help him out, give him protection, so on and so forth. Jacob declines for several reasons. First of all, the fighting men would grow impatient with the slow progress of the women and children and animals. These guys are they're fighters, they're not, they're not babysitters. Uh, secondly, Jacob probably did not want to begin living uh, associated with Esau because Esau had a very different lifestyle than he has. And of course he was confident that now that Esau was no longer a threat, he wouldn't face any other danger. He was fully confident in God's protection. So he's traveling slowly, he makes a kind of a semi-permanent camp at Succoth, which means booths, um, and um, he rests his animals. Verse 18, now Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padam Aram and camped before the city. He, brought the piece, he bought the piece of land where he had pitched his tent from the hand of the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. 
Then he erected there an altar and called it El Elohi Israel. And let's see if I got that. Okay, let me go back. All right. So the chapter ends with Jacob actually entering the land of Canaan, the land which the promise said would one day belong to his people. And he purchases a plot of land in the north from a local Canaanite chieftain. What's interesting here is this is the exact location where Abram had first entered the land long ago. If you go back to Genesis chapter 12, verse 16, this is exactly where Abram, who later became Abraham, this is where he entered the land. And so now Jacob buys a piece of land right at that spot. And, interestingly enough, it is also the place where his son, Joseph, would ultimately be buried long after Joshua. And we read about that in Joshua chapter 24, verse 32. So that piece of land, Abraham crossed it when he came in. Jacob buys that land when he returns. And eventually, many, many, many years, hundreds of years later, that's the place where Joseph is going to be buried uh, when he says to the children to you know, bring their, his bones back and bury him in, uh, in the promised land. So Jacob builds an altar here and he uses his new name for the first time by calling the altar, God is the God of Israel. So it's a token step that in a land of idolatry, Jacob establishes the first place where the land and the altar are owned by believers of the true God. Just one little spot. The land belongs to the believers. The altar is used by believers. The rest of the land is completely pagan. All right, so we'll stop there. A couple of lessons I got ahead on my, on my PowerPoint here, but a couple of lessons that kind of call out to us. First, of course, if God is with you, who can be against you? Jacob learned from experience that no matter how long they tried or how strong they were, his enemies could not prevail against him because he was a child of God. Laban could not destroy his, you know, his life, his enthusiasm and his family, and his brother would not kill him so long as he was protected. So our shield today is faith. Our strength is right living, and our weapon is the word of God. Nothing new, but certainly a lesson coming from that. In Jacob's world, or in our modern world, those who are on God's side have nothing to fear because as Jesus says, once they've taken the body, there's nothing left that they can, that they can do. The only thing they can do is, is kill you. But our enemies should be afraid of God because once He destroys their bodies, He can also destroy their souls. Not a good thing. It's not a good thing. You know, I, I think you know, when Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do, it's not a good thing for an unbeliever or a scoffer or an atheist or whatever you know, to harm a child of God. There's a reason why you should pray for them because the harm they do you is nothing compared to the harm that they will receive because of that. The suffering that we may have to endure because of unfairness or ridicule or whatever because of our faith is nothing compared to the suffering that they will endure because of their lack of faith. And that should be motivation for us to pray for people who are against us and people who, you know, who uh, denounce us because of our faith. Then the second lesson, pray with all your heart but work with all your might. You can't substitute faith for work. Faith is the belief that God is true to His word, but there's nothing in His word to suggest that faith somehow substitutes for honest effort and courage and perseverance. Jacob believed, but he worked 20 years for his father-in-law. Jacob believed and he had two angels, but he still worked hard to appease his brother and to reconcile with Him. Our spirit requires us to pray like everything depends on God, and our human nature requires us to work like everything depends on us. That's, that's the proper balance. The combination of the two makes for a soul that honors God through a faith 
demonstrated an honest effort, not just talk. You know, there's lots of talk. talk. Do we have any shortage of talk in our world? Right, 24-7, you know, 5,000 channels. Everybody's an expert. Talk, 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 talk. We have plenty of talk. Number three, when I am weak, I am strong. Jacob had to lose even his physical strength. <laughs> even his physical strength. He was afraid his brother was going to kill him. And God says, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to prepare you to meet your brother that you're afraid of. <laughs> I'm going to make you handicapped. <laughs> you know? I mean, Gideon was reduced to 300 men to fight an army of thousands. You have to be careful when you say, God, get me ready for this. You know, boy, that's a dangerous prayer, I want to tell you right now. Paul was given a thorn in the flesh. As if he wasn't beaten up and imprisoned and scourged enough. On top of all of that, God gives him a thorn in the flesh. Jesus permitted himself to be mocked and then murdered. So God's strength and our faith are sometimes better shown when we are stripped of our glory. When it is obvious that what is being accomplished is beyond our strength and ability, then God begins to receive the glory somehow. Because it is within man's fallen nature to constantly crave God's glory. We always want to take we always want to take His glory. We always want to receive you know, the glory. I mean, it's in our nature. We have to fight that. And many times God weakens us in order to allow us to kind of show Him. You know? So we become strong as witnesses for Christ when it is His strength that is clearly seen operating in our lives. Then we can let go of pride and we are truly, truly strong, and there's so many lessons of that, I mean, in the Bible over and over again. Not new things, but certainly great lessons taught by this particular passage. Well, okay, that's uh, Jacob and Esau, round number two. We move on uh, next week, lesson 41. Appreciate your attention.